Um, a very warm welcome to Vickers Hall this evening for the second in our spring lecture series, which uh, has taken the title God and uh, Great Britain. I'm to say God and Brexit, that was enough. <laughs> but uh, if you meet, of course, on quite an auspicious occasion when I uh, planned these lectures, I didn't know that this would be the eve of Brexit itself. Um, well, I forgot too, it's also the, uh, the feast day of Charles King and Martyr, which is a, a day loaded in uh, English religious significance, uh, depending on your views about Charles I uh, and the Civil War. So um, it's quite an interesting day to then look at these two characters who um, are certainly not orthodox by uh, the standards of Charles I. Uh, and I want to begin, uh, first I should let you know that it is being filmed, but uh, none of you will be featuring it, I'm assured that by Dan, is that right? It's just looking at uh, the screen behind me, so don't worry about that. And the questions won't be uh, filmed either, so um, that's probably to protect me more, more than my ignorance, than uh, uh, your, your um, uh, knowledge. Uh, well, first let's, let me just uh, begin uh, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we ponder what it means to be a nation, what it means to be faithful to Christ, we pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see your work amongst us. In Jesus' name, Amen. And I want to begin this lecture by showing you one of William Blake's earliest engravings, dated from 1773. At a time when Blake was a young engraver, was poring over the engravings of others, learning his craft, but also developing a distinctive idiosyncratic style, a style that would bemuse and disturb, and leave him at least until the very end of his life, really, very much on the fringes of Britain's artistic life. And here we see Joseph of Arimathea whom by legend was meant to have fled from Judea to England, carrying with him the blood of Christ in the Holy Grail. He was said to have preached the gospel in our lands mere decades after the crucifixion, and even to have built a church at Glastonbury. I suspect the legend may be familiar to some of you. And the legend had a potency about it in Protestant England, because it suggested that the English church long preceded the arrival of Roman missionaries, led by Augustine in 597. And it was a legend much loved by radical Protestants, who wanted to stress the independence of England's reformed tradition. And here we see this bearded hero, a truly English prophet, if you like, providing a different religious tradition for this island from that of the church as planted by Rome and as established in Blake's own day. Based upon a depiction of Joseph by Michelangelo, Joseph is pictured in a scene of isolation, against a bleak background, a solitary and meditative figure among the rocks. It's not his finest work, it's clearly one of his earliest, but in its simplicity, in its haunted nature, and in its peculiarity, it reveals to us a distinctive vision of Britain's faith. Mystical and majestic, standing on the horizon on the eve of social, political and religious ferment across Europe. And we'll see this originality in Mary Wollstonecroft also. She gives an account of the role of men and women in society that would also be prized from the rocks of revolution with extraordinary originality. As Blake engraved this, the American colonies were in a state of turmoil, boiling over into violence and war. And within a matter of years, France too would overthrow its monarchy and the authority of the church. All at the same time, as philosophically, Christianity seemed to be on the back foot. And for many, revolution was the political working out of the Enlightenment, that broad range of thoughts that promoted human reason, which stressed the sovereignty of the individual, and which was suspicious of tradition and inherited authority. One story would treat this age revolution as the beginning of the end of Christendom, and for its accompanying institutions, political, 
and ecclesiastical. But what I hope to show over the next 45 minutes or so is that far from these figures being evidence of faith's withdrawal from British life at the Enlightenment, it shows how it was faith during this period of turbulence that animated and inspired both of these thinkers' distinctive visions of society at the turn of the 19th century. These are visions, too, which, in their peculiarity, suggest to us also the constantly disruptive and prophetic force of Christianity, of its capacity for renewal and new visions of human flourishing, even in the face of political collapse. But first of all, what was the state of Christianity in Britain at the end of the 18th century? As we heard in our last lecture, the bids for control of the national churches of Britain and Ireland had been essentially the cause of the civil wars. So in some sense, it was surprising that at the restoration of the monarchy, also there was the revival of a state church. Yet they were indeed reinstituted in England and in Scotland, each sharing a vision of a homogenous Christian society under the authority of the king. In Scotland, of course, this being a Presbyterian state church after James II's departure. And this model, but for the brief disruption of James II, essentially held sway until the 1820s. After the Glorious Revolution, uh, the arrival of William III, there was, however, a degree of religious toleration of the kind that hadn't been known before. And as William Warburton wrote, uh, who was a key church figure in the mid-century, Wherever there are diversities of religion, each sect, believing its own to be true, strives to advance itself on the ruins of the rest. What persecutions, rebellions, revolutions, loss of civil and religious liberty these intestine struggles have occasioned is well known even to such as are least acquainted with the history of mankind. The obvious remedy, he wrote, was to establish one church and give a free toleration to the rest. So the established Protestant religions, uh, religion of Britain, held sway over its endowed universities, its schools, its hospitals, its orphanages and asylums. And all of this was supported by tithes, which were still collected from the people by civil authority. That is a sort of uh, church tax. And in England, there was also legislation which limited public offices to Anglicans, even as in Scotland, uh, it, what the society was coercively uh, Presbyterian. What's more, high Tory belief in the integral nature of Christianity to civil society remained strong. Even later in the century, Christianity is part of the laws of England, declared William Blackstone in his influential legal commentaries, and its privileges, he argued, could be traced to before Charlemagne, and under George III, such privileges seemed to be in the ascendant. Alongside the state churches, toleration allowed for a range of non-conforming Christian groups, the so-called dissenters. These were people who, as we heard last time, had found their voice during the Civil Wars and the Commonwealth. For Quakers, Congregationalists, Unitarians, and others, the state churches were still perceived as a force of oppression, an instrument of the monarch. But during the reign of William and Mary, there began to be much broader toleration for such groups, even as dissenters retained a proud defense of individual conscience, a suspicion of royal authority, and a resistance to the king's religion. In this, they found an ally in the form of the English Enlightenment. Here he is. And perhaps most influentially in the writings of John Locke, writing at the end of the 17th century. Locke had been born to Puritan parents in 1632 and later established himself in Oxford as a chemist, a medic, and a philosopher, true polymath. And in his last decade, prior to his death in 1704, he devoted a lot of thought to religion. He'd written The Reasonableness of Christianity in 1695, where he argued that a rational person could indeed accept Christianity 
as it was presented in the Bible, although he firmly uh, denied original sin. But perhaps most significant was his treaties of government, coinciding with a new regime of William III, in which he defended the sovereignty of the individual, of the human being's unfettered autonomy. As much as toleration, Locke's treaties was a key moment in modernity's progress, in clarifying that by our nature, we are not under obligation to obey anyone. Rather, it is the individual who makes judgments by the laws of God and nature of what is required of him. Uh, and it was by and by large a masculine undertaking. Combined with the writings of George Barclay, an Irishman, and the Scotsman David Hume, the writings of Locke shaped a British Enlightenment that increasingly stressed the importance of the individual in perception, in reasoning, in giving and refusing assent, and indeed in the task of theology. In this new era, thinking and writing about God began to be not so much the preserve of clergy or scholars as Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, St Andrews or Trinity Dublin, but the free inquiry of the individual believer. And with censorship having largely been banned in Britain from 1695, the British Isles became a fertile seedbed for this fresh thinking in religion as much as in its politics. And I give this background because whereas in the Civil War the theological speculations of radicals might have been regarded as esoteric and a fringe activity, by the late 18th century, Radical theology was finding itself enmeshed in a conversation about radical politics, the nature of authority in society as a whole, and all of it buttressed by this new Enlightenment philosophy. If the world was now to be discerned through deductive experiments following Bacon, or describing the world without deference to, to theology following Newton, if society was to be ordered by the free ascent of individuals according to Locke, then individual experience was now everything. Now, as you can imagine, this new order naturally destabilised the structures and practice of Christianity, where scriptures, the clergy, and the official liturgies all underlined that truth came not from below, from the individual, but was received from above, from the revelation of God as delivered to us in Scripture, preserved in the tradition, defended by the clergy, and subscribed to by all Orthodox believers. And so long as that understanding was enforced by the state, by the God-installed monarchs of Europe, the church rested easy, even if Locke and others posed questions about their legitimacy. But this whole structure, settled in essence since Constantine had made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century, now fractured spectacularly. First of all, Britain's colonies in America, whose leading nonconformist thinkers had soaked up Locke, told Westminster where to put their taxes. And Britain, seen as a bastion of political tolerance relative to the rest of Europe, was given a bloody nose by the colonists declaring independence and successfully evicting British troops and declaring a republic, evicting troops from the 13 colonies in, by 1783. But far more significant, of course, was what happened in Paris at the end of that decade. As the National Assembly abolishes the Estates General, the monarch is removed and the Catholic Church is stripped of all its political and financial privileges not least by bringing tithing to an end. This wasn't just a skirmish in a foreign city, but a full frontal assault on the whole political structures that had shaped Europe since the Roman Empire. And uh, this is a very famous uh, image, which I'm, might be familiar to some of you, um, uh, by Richard Ayrley, but, but following on from uh, Zoffany. Uh, and you can see here, um, uh, you can see just about a clergyman being hanged uh, from the lampposts, uh, and the phrase, à la lanterne, uh, was uh, an indication that uh, your time was up, <laughs> um, that you soon would find yourself hanging from a lamppost as a figure of authority. And uh, as the revolution progressed, uh, a proud atheism burst violently onto the scene. Uh, apart from clergy hanging from lampposts, 
uh, during the terror, uh, there was installed in Notre Dame a cult of reason, the church having been firmly kicked out. But what would this mean in Britain? Its monarchy was far more restricted in its actions by the Parliament, and civil liberties were much more protected than in other parts of Europe. A variety of figures, most famously Edmund Burke, moved to defend the, English, the British Constitution in his reflections on the French Revolution. And the Church of England made sure its clergy were kept far away from the kinds of theological speculation that were deemed to be a major catalyst for this revolutionary fervor. And yet for dissenters, those who stood in the lineage of those mystical visionaries we heard about last time, what was happening in France was deemed to be the beginnings of a new age, of that coming millennium which had been promised and, which, and whose birth pangs now seemed to be very evident on the streets of Paris. And this is the context in which we find ourselves in London at the beginning of the 1790s. William Blake himself had been brought up in a dissenting household just north of Piccadilly, and now as a young engraver found himself working for Joseph Johnson. He was a publisher based in Newington, around whom a whole network of radical thinkers were gathered, all of whom were really fired up by the action of the National Assembly in France. Blake himself, we're told by his first biographer, Alexander Gilchrist, was an ardent Republican, sympathizing with the aims of the revolution. Hater and contemner of kings and kingcraft, he courageously donned the famous symbol of liberty and equality, the bonnet rouge, in open day, and philosophically walked the streets with the same on his head. He said to have been the only one of the sets of Johnsons who had the courage to make that public profession of faith. But Blake hated violence, and he identified strongly with victims of oppression. Uh, we're told that seeing once, uh, somewhere upon St Giles, a wife knocked about by her husband in the open street, Blake fell upon, upon him with such counter-violence of reckless and raging rebuke that we're told the, the, the violent man recoiled and collapsed. Such violence was casual and regular on the streets of London in Blake's day. We hear of foreigners being cruelly baited, animals beaten to death, expeditious vengeance meted out to thieves and pickpockets, and public whippings by the city authorities. And it was this oppression, this public violence, that Blake loathed, and he perceived it across society, and it was one of the chief reasons behind his loathing for the forces of the Crown. But even before the revolution in France, the court and government were being mocked across the city. And when the news of the revolution came, dissenters were joining with the Whigs, other radicals and artisans to welcome the French action. On the palace walls, radicals wrote slogans, no coach tax, damn Pitt, damn the Duke of Richmond, no king. And uh, you can see on one side a proclamation made in 1792 by the king uh, against uh, diverse, uh, what's the phrase, against um, yes, dis tumult and disorder as being whipped up by certain writers uh, and making it very clear that people doing, uh, undertaking that uh, sort of activity uh, will receive uh, appropriate punishment. And then here on the other side, a broadsheet from the same time by the radicals. Proclamation, a deputation of the people in council Vox populi, fellow citizens, the time is at hand when the sovereignty of the people, uh, echoing Locke, will no longer suffer themselves to be duped and trifled with the lukewarmness and apostasy of their sham representatives, but depend on their own exertions to procure a parliamentary <coughs> reform. God save the people. Pretty risky stuff to be handing out around London. Johnson's network, of which Blake was a part, was dedicated to innovation in politics, in religion, and in society at large. It included, for example, Joseph Priestley, a fervent Republican. And Johnson also published Joel Barlow's Advice to the Privileged Orders, an assault upon the monarchy, as well as an abridged version of Tom Paine's Rights of Man. Also part of this group was a young woman, Mary Wollstonecraft. 
She was also a Londoner, had grown up in Spitalfields, but unlike, unlike Blake, had grown up in an Anglican family, though not really observant, but also a very unstable family. Her father was extremely violent. And in 1778, to escape the difficulties of home, home, she left to become a lady's companion for a widow in Bath. A trying experience for her, which after three years she decided to leave behind and return to look after her dying mother. After her mother's death, she and her close friend Fanny Blood had rather audaciously set up a school in Newington Green, this centre of non-conformist activity in the north of London. And after Fanny's death, which devastated her, she undertook a brief spell as a governess in Ireland, where she was very popular with the children she instructed, even as she didn't get on with her employer, Lady Kingsborough. <coughs> William Blake would later illustrate a children's book based upon her experiences. But her frustration with her lot led her to return and, surprisingly, to make a career from writing. An extraordinarily bold move for a woman of that era. Firstly, she penned Thoughts on the Education of Daughters in 1787, followed by a novel, Mary, a fiction, in 1788. And in the first of those books, we see a faith that was steeped in orthodox attitudes, but advocating fixed principles of religion and warning of the dangers of rationalist speculation and deism. At the same time, however, she was increasingly being drawn to more radical attitudes, and as Thoughts was published, she stopped attending church, her faith being certainly uh, not uh, dryly rational, but certainly idiosyncratic. She really resented sentimentality among women, and yet believed fervently that the inner life was important. In her novel Mary, which is pretty awful, um, she describes the fictional character as possessing enthusiastic sentiments of devotion. Sublime ideas filled her young mind, she wrote, always connected with devotional sentiments. The wandering spirits which she imagined inhabited every part of nature were her constant friends and confidants. She began to consider the great first cause, formed just notions of his attributes, and in particular, dwelt on his wisdom and goodness. This is a thrilling novel, as you can tell. Uh, the fictional Mary is something of a pre, oscillating between an almost esoteric ardour, ardour and the fierce intellectualism of the day, in a manner which was not unlike Wollstonecraft herself. And it's probable that she was largely based upon her friend uh, Fanny Blood as well, who had a similar uh, uh, fierce mind. You may remember from Sarah's lecture last time how the spiritual equality of women had been an important theme at the time of the Civil War. And even in 1700, the high Anglican Mary Astle could insist that the Bible is for and not against us. Further religious revival in the early 18th century had kept such thinking alive. But by the 1780s, there was a renewed preaching against female claims, women being pushed to the edges of the evangelical movements, and with even the Tory Anglican Hannah More warning at the end of the century that the influence of religion is to be exercised with discretion by women, since a female polemic wanders about almost as far from the limits prescribed to her sex as a female Machiavelli. <laughs> the French Revolution, however, was for Wollstonecraft an opportunity. She called it a glorious chance to obtain more virtue and happiness than hitherto blessed our globe. And she sought, as she told her sister, to be a new genus. And certainly, even the revolutionaries were drawn uh, to this idea of the equality of men and women. Although in practice, in Paris, uh, women soon found themselves being very much the helpers of male revolutionaries, as uh, Rousseau had advised. But it was her pamphlets in reply to Edmund Burke, Vindication of the Rights of Men in 1790, that foot puts her squarely in the public eye. Unlike Burke's defence of the monarchy and the church, Wollstonecraft, in the manner of Tom Paine, attacked the aristocracy and encouraged republicanism. She had particular contempt for Burke's pity for Marie Antoinette and his association of beauty with passivity and femininity, 
and the sublime with masculinity and strength. <coughs> the so-called chivalry of Burke was for her the very root of the problem, she contended, arguing that such inequality was, in its irrationality, the basis of slavery and all that is inimical to liberty itself. I look into my own mind, she wrote in reply to Burke, my heart is human, beats quick with human sympathies, and I fear God. I fear that sublime power, whose motive for creating me must have been wise and good, and I submit it to the moral laws, which my reason deduces from this view of my dependence on him. It is not his power that I fear, it is not an arbitrary will, but to unerring reason I submit. Reason for Wollstonecraft was the foundation of God's throne. And unlike Rousseau, who believed women should, in their religious opinions, defer to their fathers or husbands, Wollstonecraft was very clear that for it to be allowed that women were destined by providence to acquire human virtues, and by exercise of their understandings, that stability of character which is the firmest ground to rest our future hopes upon, they must be permitted to turn to the fountain of light, and not forced to shape their course by the twinkling of a mere satellite. Such a beautiful phrase, uh, this idea that they, women will just be satellites uh, in the orbit of men. Let us then, she wrote, as children of the same parent, that is God, reason together, and learn to submit to the authority of reason. For man and woman, truth must be the same. Partly related to this equality of reasoning and virtue as the basis for female equality, Wollstonecraft mocked and derided the coquettishness of the modern woman as she saw it, taught to look pretty and giggle, to be, in her words, spaniels and toys, she argued that women should receive instead a proper education, commensurate with their possible roles, and that their essential equality was rooted in their creation as equals with men before God. Let it not be concluded, she wrote, that I wish to invert the order of things. I have already granted that from the constitution of their bodies, men seem to be designed by providence to attain a greater degree of virtue. Uh, virtue, I think, is a, a, a translation that doesn't necessarily correlate to ours. I speak collectively of the whole sex, but I see not the shadow of a reason to conclude that their virtue should differ in respect to their nature. In fact, how can they, if virtue has only one eternal standard? I must, therefore, if I reason consequently, as strenuously maintain that they have a simple direction as that there is a God. Now, that didn't stop her suggesting that the poor should be taught separately, uh, but Wollstonecraft's arguments are striking, not least given that she was almost misogynistic about the women of her own day. In fact, you can sort of hear hints of Wollstonecraft in some of Jane Austen's novels, uh, and Jane Austen's respect for um, the young woman who has a mind of her own, um, and figure sense and sensibility, and uh, some of the, you know, just also doesn't have much time for frippery in the same way that Wollstonecraft doesn't. And uh, Wollstonecraft, is always having a go at women in their willingness, in her mind, to be passive, to play ignorant, and spurn the life of the mind for that of what she called mere sensibility, blown about by every momentary gust of feeling. It might seem that Wollstonecraft's ideal woman is cruelly rational, and uh, various women, in Unitarianism in particular, drew on similar themes to express a more liberal attitude for their gender. But Unitarian preaching, Mary, criti uh, Mary criticised as cold, instrumental reason. Her account of reason was, in Barbara Turner's words, much more libidinised, an, an imaginative drive towards the true and the good, derived from Rousseau and the Christian Platonist tradition. But to know God is not merely to appreciate him, it is uh, but to adore him. And this was uh, reason, in her mind, as a type of eros, uh, an erotic desire for God in the tradition of St. Augustine. The imaginative, erotic mind for her had a heavenward direction, uh, and if you read the Vindication of the Rights of Woman, uh, you will know that the highly sexualized language, uh, even if she's coming uh, come for a lot of criticism from feminists, 
for her assertion that female sexuality is too sensuous for the visionary grandeur of erotic love, even as she herself uh, was rocked by her own sexual feelings for her lover and father of her first child, Gilbert Inlay. But she does have this, uh, some of her later writings have this slight oddness that once you get married, the expectation is that you'll settle into a life of the mind, that sex will just uh, drop away, and that may be true for some people, um, but uh, for, her, for her to advocate it seems quite odd, and it certainly seems uh, true for um, uh, many feminists. Now, nonetheless, it's clear that her revolutionary vision for women as equals in society was rooted in her religion, in a faith that wasn't consolation, but a revolutionary account of the subjectivity of the inner life, which she regarded as reasonable, common to both men and women, as they were created by God. Now, not surprisingly, such radical ideas provoked strong reactions. Joseph Johnson's circle was branded by Tories as atheists and traitors. And while Wollstonecraft's religion uh, looks very much like that of a Unitarian by the end of her life, in 1797, dying not uh, long after giving birth to Mary Shelley, Blake's own religion was distinctively different. And here is an important distinction to make. Because while Johnson had pain, Wollstonecraft, and priestly around his dinner table on a regular basis, we hear that Blake only ever dined with them once. His radicalism comes from an altogether different strand of dissent one which takes us back somewhat to the mystical writings of Jacob Berman, whom Blake greatly admired and whom Sarah spoke about last time. But more imp importantly, he inhabited the Bible in a way that perhaps is tricky for us to imagine now, and in a way which uh, Mary Wollstonecraft would have found quite odd. He grew up steeped in the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, in Job, and in the strange disorienting stories of Genesis. He absorbed God, not as he appeared in the sentimental images of household Bibles of his day, but God as a consuming fire, the God of Revelation, of Daniel, and of the angelic hosts. And um, now this is uh, his little drawing of uh, his, uh, the cottage in Feltham, uh, which many of you, I no doubt, know about. I get to visit, actually. Um, but uh, he famously saw uh, an angel, uh, angels in the tree there, um, and uh, this is a much later uh, engraving uh, of Jacob's dream. Uh, angels were very much present to him. They weren't just literary conceits. For Blake had visions from an early age. Uh, we're told that um, as he walked out into the countryside through the villages of uh, what is now South London, um, uh, Blake, on Peckham Rye by Dulwich Hill, um, would uh, relate how when he was quite a child, of eight or ten perhaps, he had his first vision. His first biographer writes, Sauntering along, the boy looks up and sees a tree filled with angels, bright angelic wings, bespangling every bough like stars. Returning home, he relates the incident, and only through his mother's intercession he escapes a thrashing from his father for telling a lie. Another time, one summer morn, he sees the haymakers at work, and amid them, angelic fig figures walking. And his wife, Catherine, to whom he was devoted throughout his life, relates how his mother uh, beat him for running in one day and saying that he'd seen the prophet Ezekiel under a tree in the fields. Throughout his life, uh, as one early biographer commented, the scripture overruled his imagination, such that he saw it materialising around him. And it wasn't limited to his childhood. Famously, uh, even when living down the road, he went, when he went to take up a job uh, providing engravings for William Haley, Blake saw angels in a tree by his cottage. And he described it thus to Anna Flaxman, the wife of the artist and sculptor John Flaxman, who's responsible for several memorials in the cathedral. Felton, he wrote to her, is a sweet place for study because it's more spiritual than London. I'm not asked to a bother anymore. Um, <laughs> heaven opens here on all sides, her golden gates, her windows are not obstructed by vapours. Voices of celestial inhabitants are more distinctly heard, and their forms more distinctly seen, and my cottage is also a shadow of their houses. This capacity for seeing visions he considered a great gift, one also that his brother had to some degree, who claimed to have seen Moses and Abraham. 
But these visions, which he regularly depicted, and his poetry, which he considered to be akin to dictation, meant that he stood quite removed from the more rationalist, philosophical impulses of the Unitarians and someone like Mary Wollstonecraft. It's actually very hard to pin him in the religious landscape of his day. He's rooted in a dissenting background, and Blake had no time for organised religion, and certainly not the Church of England. Nonetheless, he was very open to beliefs if they confirmed his spiritual instincts, uh, not least the writings of the Swedish theologian Emanuel Swedenborg. He was uh, another visionary uh, earlier in the century who conversed with angels and spirits, and who suggested that uh, immediately upon death, our souls rise as spiritual beings. And uh, he was very popular with John Flaxman, that's probably where Blake uh, learned about him. And um, uh, it's a lovely uh, drawing of Flaxman. Um, and you, in St. Kevin's Chapel, you may recognise this uh, as you go in and turn left. It's easily missed, not very well lit. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think it, I could be wrong, I'm not a, a, a historian, but um, it certainly echoes Swedenborg's uh, vision of the dead rising beautifully. Uh, of course, it's very popular there at Gill. And you can actually see, when you think about Eric Hill's um, waving hair, you can see a bit of that in um, Flaxman's own uh, remarkable sculpture. Um, there's another one in that uh, chapel as well, but uh, not, not with the dead rising like that. Um, but uh, yes, uh, this, this understanding probably appealed to Blake. Uh, he said to have seen his brother's spirit rising uh, when he died. And along with mesmerists, Freemasons, and occultists, the Swedenborgians, as they were known, found a ready audience in London for people who wanted, like Blake, to underline the primacy of the spiritual world. And it's easy to see why, because when you're presented with all this rational theology as being pumped out by the established church, and even by a lot of free thinkers like, um, like Wollstonecraft, it lacks a certain vitality, a certain warmth that appeals to the heart. So it's not surprising in a way that this sort of religious uh, interest would emerge uh, along as a kind of counterblast. Uh, you know, it's the beginning of rom romanticism in that sense. For the likes of Johnson uh, and Priestley, however, this was all a bit vulgar, very esoteric, and certainly lacking in reason. But for Blake, true religion could not be ordered, either by priestcraft or by the state, or indeed by reason but by what he saw as a virulent unity with God, a unity which he saw expressed in Jesus. In his poem, The Everlasting Gospel, he writes, If he had been Antichrist creeping Jesus, he'd have done anything to please us, gone sneaking into synagogues, and not used the elders and priests like dogs, but humble as a lamb or ass, obeyed himself to Caiaphas. God wants not man, to humble himself. Indeed, that's uh, the self-denial that characterised Orthodox Christianity in Blake's mind was, he felt, far removed from what he called the energy that animated the soul, which he called eternal delight. In The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, uh, an extended poem uh, published in 1791, Blake presents himself and his fellow engravers in London as printers devils. As devils, they trade places with strict Christians or self-appointed angels and turn conventional hierarchies such as heaven above hell, soul above body, upside down. And Blake urges his readers to think by contraries, is what he says, to value, and it's very shocking language, to value hell as productive, energizing chaos, and to try out the delights of disobedience. He includes strange proverbs, drive your cat and your plough over the bones of the dead, and soon murder an infant in its cradle, then nurse unacted desires. <coughs> Not the sort of thing you'd be hearing in a pulpit at just the cathedral at the time. <laughs> but Blake didn't limit himself to an assault on organised religion. Like Wollstonecraft, Priestley and others, he also saw an urgent need for political and social change. But unlike them, Blake didn't write cogent pamphlets. He offers vision, visions. And we're going to look at a few of them. How we take time? Okay, uh, keep moving. Um, firstly, perhaps his uh, most well known corpus, uh, The Songs of Innocence and Experience. First composed and published uh, as a few copies in 1789, 
and then an expanded version published more widely five years later. And in this work, Blake explore, explores a state of paradise in the songs of innocence and a state of fall in the songs of experience. He, he thought of childhood as a period of innocence, only to then be corrupted by the oppressive forces of the state, of the church, and the aristocracy into what he calls experience. And the plates uh, are some of the most well-known of plates, uh, including the tiger and the lamb. But for our purposes of thinking about uh, revolutionary visions, I wanted us to focus uh, on three. Uh, and the first two are Holy Thursday, one in the Songs of Innocence and one in the Songs of Experience. Uh, and I'll read Holy Thursday for you because it's not easy to see in uh, his engraving. Towards on that holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean, the children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Grey-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow, till into the high dome of pools they like Thames waters flow. Sorry, I'm going to get the scouting right. But there they are, going into the, uh, St Paul's Cathedral. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, these flowers of London town. Seated in companies, they sit with radiance all their own. The hum of multitudes was there, but multitudes of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls, raising their innocent hands. Now, like a mighty wind, they raised to heaven the voice of song, or like harmonious thunderings, the seats of heaven among, beneath them sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor, then cherish pity, lest you drive an angel from your door. So that's the, the first one there is picturing this uh, festival event of children, uh, children of a particular charity going on Ascension Day to St Paul's Cathedral, Ascension Day obviously being a Thursday, in which children who are recipients of charity come together to thank God. And then we have on the other side this hard-hitting critique of what it was actually like for most children in, in London. Is this a holy thing to see? in a rich and fruitful land, babes reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurous hand. Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many children poor, it is a land of poverty. And their sun does never shine, and their fields are bleak and bare, and their ways are filled with thorns. It is eternal winter there. Far where the sun does shine, and where the rain does fall, Babe can never hunger there, nor poverty, the mind of all. So on the other hand, we have this uh, vision of London where, where children are reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurious hand. Uh, and as Chris Rowland has written, uh, who was a professor at Oxford until recently, uh, writing a lot about Blake and religion, the Holy Thursday poems offer readers the opportunity to meditate upon late 18th century England through the lens of a particular social event. Here is an example of the focus on what uh, he calls the minute particular, using one event to open up a different perspective on the reality of a wider context. But for Blake, here was Britain, the heart of its empire, the heart of its established church, and an industrial complex which had brought untold wealth into the city of London. And yet, here is the church, uh, with its vehicles for charity and beneficence. And yet, here also, children on the street, that cold and userous hand, uh, could refer, in fact, to the church itself. Nonetheless, so long as so many children are poor, Britain remains, he thinks, in a perpetual winter. The sun never shining, its fields bleak and bare, its ways filled with thorns. And on that theme, here's another one from the Songs of Experience, uh, London, which is probably well known to you to that. I wandered through each chartered street, near where the chartered tenders does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. And most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plague the marriage hurts. 
Um, so, yeah, quite a provocative uh, uh, language. Blake imagining himself like the prophet Ezekiel, um, you can see in the top there, walking around the streets of Jerusalem and seeing people disfigured with marks of weakness and marks of woe as a result of poverty, injustice, social convention, and the strangleholds of emerging capitalism. He identified what he called the mind forward manacles, that pressure to conform culturally, which stops people, in his mind, from reaching their full potential. This sort of writing is a world away from Burke, Wollstonecraft, Priestley, and his other visions later in the decade, which are very complex and not hard to uh, explain uh, simply in, in this lecture, um, go even further. He, he imaginatively retells the revolutions in America in 1793, and then Europe in 1794, um, developing his own uh, curious mythology in the vein of Dante or Milton, uh, quite possibly to avoid being uh, taken to court. Um, the time prohibits an inspection of those too carefully, but um, as we uh, draw nearer to the end, I wanted to um, look at probably his most famous uh, piece of writing, not least um, on this particular evening, it might be worth looking at. This is the, um, uh, his response to the upheavals on the continent um, and in the nation. This, probably his most famous plate uh, in terms of poetry, written and illustrated whilst here in Sussex. Uh, that is the preface to his epic poem, Milton, and did those feet in ancient time. Confusingly, it's not part of his poem called Jerusalem, um, even though we call it Jerusalem, uh, but the poem is better expressed uh, did those feet in ancient time. And it's almost, of course, as we know, become the English national anthem, uh, in which Blake merges the history of the ancient Britons with the Hebrew Bible and the historical chronicles of the Jews. Here he imagines an infant Jesus travelling with Joseph of Arimathea, who we saw in our first slide, who was a tin merchant, coming to our green and pleasant land, which for Blake uh, is uh, just down the road, uh, and uh, Jerusalem, a type of heaven, appearing miraculously in our midst. The dark satanic mills, there's lots of uh, controversy about what he might be referring to, um, and uh, it might be that he's thinking about those uh, really unpleasant mills which were working uh, overtime in London and causing a lot of uh, grief and oppression for those who work there. But it's also possible that he's referring uh, to the Church of England as, uh, as this uh, grim, um, yeah, churning of, um, of people uh, in a satanic fashion. And the plate ends, uh, you'll see, uh, with uh, a quotation his, from Numbers 11. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And it's interesting that this is written at the same time as Blake is arrested um, in uh, Feltham and taken to court here in Chichester in um, the Guildhall in Priory Park. And um, uh, this was uh, after he uh, got rather shirty with a soldier who uh, was urinating in his garden. And um, uh, he was uh, taken to court for having uttered seditious and treasonable expressions. Uh, I think he was saying, you know, damn the king, damn the king's, uh, king's men. But he was acquitted. And the aim of the poem, and of these prophecies more generally, was, uh, as Roland argues, that everyone has the task of speaking out about what they see. Prophecy for Blake was not a prediction of the end of the world, but telling the truth as best a person can about what he or she sees, fortified by insight and honest persuasion, that with personal struggle he really believes that things could be improved. A human being observes, is indignant, and speaks out. And it's a basic political maxim which is necessary in Blake's mind for every age. He wanted to stir the people up from their intellectual slumbers and the daily grind of their toil, and to see that they were captivated in the grip of a culture which kept them from thinking in ways which served the interests of the powerful. Now, it won't be lost uh, on many of you that we do indeed meet on the night of Britain's exit from the European Union. Uh, and I don't think that event, uh, who knows, will be akin to the French Revolution in shaping the, um, the future of Europe, though, again, who knows. Now, I, I would describe myself as a natural theological radical, I mean, I stand here as a, a clergyman of the Church of England, having taken oaths of allegiance to Her Majesty. 
But the theological, uh, the theologies of Blake and Wollstonecraft, I find um, strange, disorientating, certainly not orthodox, but rather thrilling. Uh, William Wordsworth would call Blake an insane genius. But prophets rarely are considered normal or orthodox. Uh, we see this in scripture, uh, where strange characters routinely emerge from the fringes, like Ezekiel, not least Jesus himself, and who rise up to denounce priestcraft, uh, who, who, to denounce the oppression of the temple authorities, and to uh, make a renewed appeal for the believer and the nation to return to a simplicity of heart. You can see that in all the prophets in the Old Testament in various ways, seeking a renewed union with God, which will result not just in holiness, but in the renewal of the nation for peace, justice, and the raising up of the poor. As I'm sure it would uh, also be noted by many of you, the themes that Blake and Wollstonecraft identify remain very much part of our public protest and discourse today. This sense that there is two nations, uh, one where, where people really flourish, indeed become extraordinarily rich as a result of our own day's technological advances, and yet others are excluded, flounder, and become lost. Uh, some of the scenes from the songs of experience are frankly still visible on the streets of our cities today. We might also imagine that uh, following on from the bishop's strictures about sex outside of marriage, uh, that Wollstonecraft and Blake would have plenty to say to those bishops uh, about how we should use our bodies and who can tell us how to use our bodies, whether that's bishops or indeed Instagram. Blake, in particular, uh, remained indign indignant until his death in 1827 about the depiction of God as a remote monarch or lawgiver. Anticipating some major themes in 20th century theology, he considered this only justification for what he considered to be an authoritarianism of both the state and the church. The Bible for Blake was not to be a kind of holy rule book, according to which priests and rulers could police people, but what he called a collection of sentiments and examples which engage the imagination. That is, it should be a spur to new life, to the energetic, recreative work of God within each one of us, and a stimulus to a new society where the divine image would radiate from everyone, a new Jerusalem that he believes could yet be discerned in this green and pleasant land. In that sense, I suspect Blake would have had as little time for the political rancour and virtue signalling of social media as the considered opinions of ecclesiastical lawyers. Much more so than Wollstonecraft, he believed that human flourishing comes from our capacity to engage with our divine imagination and to speak, in whatever stumbling way we can, of a life yet unknown. So on the eve of Brexit, uh, when we see a nation very tired of cultural wars, discombobulated by technological change, and young, yet nonetheless suspicious of jingoism, it seems to me that Blake and Wollstonecraft both speak to us of the importance of integrity and of the poetic power of the imagination to bring new wisdom spiritual nourishment and hope church and nation could do with more like them thank you